Hello everybody, a slightly different video this time. Often when I'm researching a topic or simply reading for my own enjoyment, I find my path forking and forking again. It is one of the joys of having access to hundreds of thousands of original documents through the internet and evidence of my inability to stay focused that I can start looking into one thing and end up learning about something completely different. And I feel sorry for people who deny themselves the opportunities the information age has brought them simply because their dogma conflicts with reality and their belief is more important to them than their education. For this video, I thought I would let you follow one of my little journeys. I hope that you enjoy my version of Six Degrees of Separation. Anna Harriet Leonowens was born on November the 5th, 1831 the night when bonfires, guys, and effigies of the Pope are burnt to remember the foiled attempt by Catholics to blow up the British Houses of Parliament and its King, James VI, in 1605. We all know Anna from the fictional portrayal of her by Deborah Kerr in the 1956 film adaptation of the stage musical originally written as a vehicle for Gertrude Lawrence, The King and I which starred, of course, Yul Brynner, who, incidentally, I discovered, was not bald, but simply decided to keep his trademark slaphead after filming had finished. The real Anna Leonowens spent six years instructing the 39 wives and 82 children of King Mongkut of Siam, because he desired they have a secular education unattainable through Christian missionary teachers. Now, Anna had a sister, Eliza, and this sister had a grandson named William Henry Pratt. You, of course, know him by another name, not Adam, the name his character gave himself, or the often erroneously attributed eponym of Adam's creator. But you do know him as Boris Karloff, who variously played both Adam and his creator, Dr. Frankenstein, in several films starting in 1931. You might not know that after Dr. Frankenstein famously ejaculates, It's, it's alive. alive! He originally continued, In the name of God, God. Now, now I know, I know what, what it feels, feels to be to God. God. The censors removed this blasphemy from the film before it could be released. In 1962, Boris Karloff introduced the 13-episode ABC series Out of This World a sci-fi spin-off of the Sidney Newman-produced armchair theatre, and akin to The Twilight Zone. Only a single episode of that series still exists. The episode is called Little Lost Robot, an adaptation of the 1947 story by Isaac Asimov, in which, coincidentally, Asimov uses the term Frankenstein complex to describe the fear humans have of robots. Out of This World did not survive for a second series, as Newman, already well known as the creator of The Avengers, was poached by the BBC as their new head of drama. Within a year at the BBC, he had picked up on a new idea for a science fiction programme that had been knocking about for a few months. It was Newman who came up with the idea for a time machine that would be bigger on the inside than the outside, piloted by a mysterious Doctor. And for the second series of Doctor Who, the BBC called on the talents of the writer who had adapted Little Lost Robot for Out of This World, one Terry Nation, creator of the Daleks. Later in life, Terry Nation would script the 70s cult series Blake's Seven, which, whilst crappy and very British, is owed a lot by many vastly more successful sci-fi series which would follow it. Now, the female lead in Blake's Seven was Jenna Stannis, played by Sally Nivette, who later became a regular on the soap Emmerdale. But more interesting to me, at least, is that Sally is a direct descendant of Thomas Nivette, who, on the 5th of November, 1605, caught one Guy Fawkes playing with matches under the Houses of Parliament. Thomas had a nephew, Anthony, who sailed with Thomas Cavendish on his second fateful attempt at circumnavigation. 
we have an edited record of Antony Nivet's adventures from the 1625 publication Hacloitus Posthumus, or Purchase His Pilgrims, a vast collection of stories of travellers, ancient and modern, to purchase, which was republished in 20 volumes in 1906 and is now available at archive.org. Samuel Purchase was a very devout man, as both his introduction to the original 1625 edition and his will, published in the 1906 reprint, attest. His intention from the outset was to present the wonders and diversity of God's creation from an Anglican viewpoint. His first book, Purchase His Pilgrimage, was published in 1613 and was an instant hit. Hacloitus Posthumus, or Purchase His Pilgrims, was a continuation of the work of Richard Hackloyd, another devout, who, in 1589, had published The Principal Navigations, Voyages and Discoveries of the English Nation, which was based on eyewitness testimony wherever possible. Hackloyd died in 1616, and many of his papers ended up in purchase possession. Both men's work have to be read in the context that they were Anglicans, at a time when there was great rivalry with exploring Catholic nations and between Catholics and Anglicans at home. The Pope, who had been Dad's route to God, was now the devil incarnate. It is obvious, for example, that Purchase has redacted and edited Thomas Nivet's account of his travails to remove any possible pro-Catholic sentiment. That the religious conspire to deceive in the worship of their chosen deity appears to be a universal through time and space. But this all said, Hackloyd and Purchase have left us with some of the only sources for early explorations. So whilst we must, as with all uncorroborated accounts, resist accepting that which appears incredible, it is worth reading these works to get a flavour of what life was like for our forebears, and also as original reference material where none other is available. With that preamble, I want to look at Antony Nivet's story. He tells us how in Tierra del Fuego, with cold there died every day out of our ship eight or nine men, and how after a trip ashore to get food in which he got soaked, the next morning I was numbed that I could not stir my legs, and pulling off my stockings, my toes came with them, and all my feet were as black as soot, and I had no feeling of them. He also tells us how here one Harris, a goldsmith, lost his nose, for going to blow it with his fingers, cast it into the fire. As said, Cavendish's second trip was a disaster. He himself did not survive it, what drove him we cannot know. He had inherited a fortune at the age of twelve and apparently enjoyed an idle youth, but at the age of twenty-five he was sailing with Richard Grenville to try and plant settlers on the stony ground of Roanoke. By the age of twenty-eight he had completed the first planned circumnavigation of the globe, returned to England with a vast treasure of plundered gold, silk, musk and spices, been knighted by the Queen and become a national hero. Yet something drove him on to go to sea again. On his second voyage, having failed in his first attempt to cross into the Pacific, and having lost most of his men and ships to the weather, cold, disease, and battles with the Portuguese, he decided to offload the sick and dying, including Antony Nivet, who had very sorry clothes, the toes of my feet full of lice, that, God is my record, they lay in clusters within my flesh. Apparently Cavendish got hold of a surgeon who cured with words. This man coming aboard our ship said some words over my feet, and I had feeling in my legs and feet which I had lost before. The fleet lost dozens more men in attempts to land before Nivet and around 60 others were dumped on a beach and left to their own devices. Eventually Nivet and one other were taken prisoner by the Portuguese, all the others having died or been killed. Nivet then regales us with his years spent in South America, often as a slave working the sugar plantations. His luck waxes and wanes continually as he is beaten, shipwrecked, poisoned, only to be saved by a unicorn's horn, and is in and out of favour with the local Portuguese and native tribes, before he finally makes his way back to England. Obviously his story is written long after the events, but we can be sure at least that he had a torrid time of it. 
and if only half of what he writes is an accurate history of his life, then he endured more than I would wish on my worst enemy. Thomas Cavendish's own account of the last voyage is no less harrowing. Written by a sick and dying man, he would not make it back to England, and in part a last will and testament, he lays the blame for the trip's failure squarely on the shoulders of John Davis, a renowned navigator of the age and inventor of the backstaff, or Davis Quadrant. Davis had captained the Desire, Cavendish's own ship from the first voyage, but had become separated from Cavendish suffered his own travails, and eventually returned to England with only 15 of his 78 crew surviving. He would later sail with Sir Walter Raleigh, and as chief pilot on the first voyage of the East India Company, and would then be killed by pirates off Singapore on a subsequent voyage. But let us not dwell on disasters. Instead, we can look at Cavendish's first voyage, and one specific point therein. In 1586, Cavendish, with three small boats and around 120 men, set sail. Via Sierra Leone, Cape Verde and Rio de Janeiro, they arrived at a small harbour on the 16th of December, which Cavendish named Port Desire, after his ship. It was here where a man and a boy, in washing their clothes at a pit, were hurt by the savages' arrows, which are made of canes headed with flints. They are very wild. We took the measure of one of their feet, and it was 18 inches long. Giants. First-hand eyewitness evidence of giants. How do you measure the feet of a wild, giant savage? Of course you don't. You measure the footprints they leave in the sand or dirt around the pit. And then you are not measuring their feet, but their footwear. After entering the Straits of Magellan, Cavendish picked up 24 Spaniards who were all that was left of around 300 who had been put there in 1584 as Spain tried to build settlements to protect their treasure routes and defend against piracy. Cavendish named that place Port Famine. It would be here in 1828 that Captain Pringle Stokes would commit suicide in his cabin after which a 23-year-old meteorologist and surveyor, Lieutenant Robert Fitzroy, was given temporary command of his ship. Fitzroy would later return to Tierra del Fuego again as captain of this same ship, HMS Beagle, on its second and most famous voyage. It was, in fact, the suicide of Stokes and his own uncle which convinced Fitzroy that he needed a companion for the second voyage. That companion, of course, was one Charles Darwin. Fitzroy's fears turned out to be prescient. In 1865, the then Admiral Fitzroy would cut his own throat. But back to the giants of Tierra del Fuego. Of course, Cavendish's crew were not the first to meet these giant savages. An eyewitness report exists of Magellan's voyage. Magellan sailed in September 1519 with five ships and around 270 men. Magellan, of course, died in the Philippines. Only 22 men survived the three-year voyage. Two accounts of the voyage exist. One is by Maximilianus Transylvanus. What a name. Sounds like a vampire porn star. He interviewed crew members to produce his report. The other is a report by Antonio Pigafetta, who had been Magellan's assistant on the voyage. The Hakluyt Society published a compendium of the accounts, which provides detail of the Patagonian giants. Patagonia, named, according to Pigafetta, after the big feet. Though the etymology is unclear, pata for foot is fine, but where the suffix gon comes from is unknown. Anyway, one account reads, There were people like savages, and the men are from nine to ten spans in height. That's six foot nine to seven foot six. They are all of them archers and kill many animals with arrows, and with the skins they make clothes. When they do not wish to be clothed from the waist upwards, they let that half fall which is about the waist, and the garment remains hanging down from the belt which they have girt round them. They wear shoes which cover them four inches above the ankle, full of straw inside to keep their feet warm. The straw-filled shoes might well explain the documented 18-inch feet. And to Europeans with an average height of perhaps 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7, these natives wearing loose-fitting guanaco skins might well have seemed like giants. 
Antonio Pigafetta records of one giant, he was so tall that the tallest of us only came up to his waist. You can choose to believe that there were 11 foot giants or that Pigafetta's memory exaggerated what must have been for him a novel experience. Almost immediately prior to this, we have him telling us, in this place we endured a great storm and thought we should have been lost. But the three holy bodies, that is to say, St. Anselmo, St. Nicholas and Santa Clara appeared to us and immediately the storm ceased. Here he is, of course, describing St. Elmo's fire appearing on the ship's masts during a thunderstorm. It is worth perhaps a moment here to comment on the superstitious nature of the time. These explorers were as intelligent as any of us, but they were less educated than any of us. A quarter of a millennium before science began to provide real explanations for the workings of the natural world, many still relied on supernatural explanations for anything which they did not understand, and believed that whether they lived or died was in the hands of the gods whether an all-loving deity or capricious deities. The reason for many events was ineffable, and replacing polytheism or animism with monotheism had done little to change how people viewed life, death, or the vagaries in between. Interestingly, Magellan encountered these giants at a place he would overwinter and christen Port St. Julian. It was here that his crew mutinied and where later Francis Drake would find the gallows and the remains of those he executed. It was also here, in 1834, that Charles Darwin discovered his own giant, Macrochenia, a prehistoric camelid ancestor to the llama. It was Richard Owen's later observation of the unexpectedly close relationship between extinct and extant species from a specific region, and Charles Lyell's suggestion of a law of succession, where mammals are replaced by their own kind on each continent, which would lead Darwin in 1837 to write in his notebook, my theory would give zest to recent and fossil comparative anatomy. And also, in July, opened first notebook on transmutation of species, had been greatly struck from about month of previous March on character of South American fossils and species on Galapagos archipelago. These facts origin, especially latter, of all my views. And soon after, 20 years before the final publication of Origin, he drew his famous, I think, diagram. I find Darwin's real giants and the implication of him finding them much more exciting than an obviously, if not deliberately, exaggerated story of humanoid giants in Patagonia. We know that eyewitness testimony is not to be trusted, and just because something is written down does not mean that it is true, however much you want it to be. So that is the end of the land of the giants, except to fill in the blanks. The reason Magellan was trying to find a route round South America to the East Indies was because of the 1529 Treaty of Zaragoza, which followed the 1494 Treaty of Tortillas, in which the Pope divided the world amongst his two exploring Catholic kingdoms of Spain and Portugal to ensure that they got a fair share of the spoils from overthrowing the barbarians and bringing them to the one true faith. When Portugal discovered the Spice Islands, Spain discovered that the route to them was through Portugal's half of the world. Spain therefore needed a route west to the Moluccas. And when Portugal first conquered Malacca in 1511, they sent a diplomatic mission to the Ayataya Kingdom to become the first Europeans to meet the King of Siam. Thank you as always for watching. 